called Out of Pharaoh's House. He has his experience with the burning bush. He hears the voice of God coming out of a burning bush on the side of a mountain. And through this encounter, he, he, him and Aaron go back to Pharaoh, and then we have the we have the Exodus. We have Moses setting the people of Israel free. He goes back with the famous, let my people go. Pharaoh uh, refuses. The plagues come. Pharaoh says, okay, go for it. The children of Israel leave Egypt full of treasure, full of stuff, and they make their way into the, into the wilderness, into the desert, on their way to the land of promise, the promised land. Now, the very first thing, one of the first things that happens when the children of Israel are released from the land of Egypt is they come to the Red Sea. Right, And they have Egypt at their back. They have the Red Sea in front of them. And Moses cries out to the Lord, says, what are we supposed to do? He says, lift up your staff and I'll, I will part the waters and you'll walk across on dry ground. So Moses lifts up his staff. The children of Israel cross through on dry ground. Now for the next 40 years, they wander around the wilderness. They wander around the desert following a pillar of fire at night and a cloud by day for direction on where to go. This generation that has never known freedom, a people that haven't known freedom for 400 years, they're now free as their own people wandering around in the desert, following Moses, following the Lord. And in this season, they're learning to be dependent upon the Lord, following this pillar of fire at night, this cloud by day. Every morning, they're not allowed to go and gather food. They, the only thing they're allowed to eat is the manna that comes from heaven, fresh every morning. This dependence on the Lord is growing. Now, this, in this generation, they get to the promised land and they send in spies. You guys remember this? They send spies into the promised land to go and, and, and check it out to see what's going on. And when the spies come back, they send 12 spies in. Two spies say, God can give us the land, we should take it. The other spies come back and say, no, the people are too big, the cities are too strong. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's amazing, but God can't, not even God could give us that land. It's not time. It's not time. And so because of that, the Lord decides that that generation has to pass away before the children of Israel are allowed to enter into the promised land, all except for Caleb and Joshua, the two spies that said God could give us the land. Now, so where we are right now in this passage is Moses has passed away. That generation has passed away. And now Joshua has been put in charge of the children of Israel. He takes command of the people of God. And they're at the banks of the river, and they, they cross the Jordan River the same way that they crossed the Red Sea. When they were set free from their oppressors, they crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. And now to leave the, the wilderness, they're about to cross the Jordan River on dry ground once again to enter into the Promised Land. So Joshua calls together the priests, and he has them take the Ark of the Covenant and go before the people of Israel. I know this is a lot of setup, but it'll make sense as we go. He tells them to go before the people of Israel. Now, as the priests step onto the water, the water parts, and there's dry ground once again. The priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the manifestation of the presence of the Lord on the earth at the time. And the priests stood in the middle of the river, and they stayed there the whole time while the people of Israel crossed the Jordan River into the Promised Land. Now, where we are right here is the people of Israel have just finished crossing the Jordan, and the Lord speaks to Joshua. Okay? All right, so Joshua chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 1. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man for each tribe. And command them saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you and lay them down in the lodging place where you, are, where you will lodge tonight. Go down to verse 8. Thus the sons of Israel did as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones from the middle of the Jordan, just as the Lord spoke to Joshua, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. And they carried them over with them to the lodging place and put them down there. Now we'll go over to verse 19. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the 10th of the first month and camped at Gilgal on the eastern edge of Jericho. Those 12 stones which they had taken from the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal. He said to the sons of Israel, when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, what are these stones? Then you shall inform your children, saying, Israel crossed this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until he had crossed, just as the Lord your God had done to the Red Sea, 
which he had dried up before us until we had crossed. That all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, so that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Okay. So they get to the other side of the Jordan River, and God speaks to Joshua. And he says, Joshua, I want you to take one man from each tribe, and I want you to send them back into the river. Send them back to where the priests are standing in the very center of the river, where they're holding the presence of the Lord. The priests that are there ministering to the presence of the Lord as God did miracles among them, go back to that very spot, and I want each man to grab a stone. I want each man to grab a stone, and now you're going to take those stones, and the first place that you lay your head in the promised land, the first place that you're going to lay your head, I want you to build a monument with the stones that you grab. And so Joshua grabs one man from each tribe. He sends them back into the Jordan River to the priests, has them each grab a stone. They take those stones. They sleep at Gilgal that night. So Joshua builds a monument, and he gathers the people of Israel together, and he, he makes this declaration to them that I think is absolutely amazing. He says, guys, those rocks that you grab from the river, you're going to set them up here and they're going to stay here forever because in times to come when your children and your children's children come over and they see this pile of rocks, it's going to be more than just a pile of rocks. When they come and they ask you, why did you put stones up in this place? You're going to look to your children. You're going to say, this is a monument to the faithfulness of God that took us out of the wilderness, brought us into the promised land, that we crossed the river on dry ground, the same way that he had our ancestors, the last generation, cross the, the, the Red Sea on dry ground, the same faithfulness that he showed them in, re, in releasing them from Egypt, that same faithfulness he showed to us in releasing us from the wilderness, that same faithfulness Faithfulness will be shown to you in your generation and to the next generation and to the next. See, it was more than just rocks. These were rocks at the feet of the priests that were holding the Ark of the Covenant, the place where God had chosen to rest. And, and God in his wisdom knew that just because the next generation was going to experience the fruit of the promised land, they weren't going to remember that they didn't pay a price that the last generation paid. So look, we got to get this. We have one generation in Egypt. We have a bunch of generations in Egypt in slavery. And then God chooses a generation to be released from the hand of Pharaoh. He chooses a generation. He says, we're going to set my people free. Their prayers have reached the heavens. It's time. I'm going to raise up for myself a deliverer. I'm going to raise up for myself one who can lead them to the promised land. And so he raises up Moses, and Moses leads a generation into freedom. They're set free from their oppressor, but now they're wandering around the wilderness trying to figure out what to do. And Moses and that generation, they can't take them all the way to the promised land, but they did take them to the bank of the river. Listen, you have this generation that's in bondage. They're set free. That generation is carrying a promise that God has a land for them, that God has a place for them. They even get to see the promise. They even get to go in and take fruit from that land and come back and say, this land is flowing with milk and honey, but there's giants in the land. They get to experience the promise, but they don't get to go into the promise. That one was for the next generation. So this generation that's been set free, now they're waiting on the bank of the river, looking, and they can see the promise, but they're not allowed to go into the promise yet. They have to wait on the bank of the river until that generation passes. Now a new generation gets to go into the promised land. And God in his wisdom knew that if the generations that follow forget the process that it took them to get there, then they would be arrogant in the land of milk and honey if they don't remember that generations before them had to go 40 years in the wilderness following the pillar of fire at night and the cloud by day. Look, if that generation that is removed, they were, they've never known Moses, they've never known Joshua, when that generation comes up and now they're building cities and now they're establishing government, if that generation forgets the faithfulness that it took by the hand of the Lord to get them into the promised land, then they're not going to stay connected to the blessing that's flowing to them through the generations. There's a couple of th things that I think are important for us to take from this. One is this, that not every promise that you receive from the Lord are you meant to experience in your lifetime. There are promises that I'm carrying 
that are so big that I think it will be my children and my children's children to see the fulfillment of the promise that I'm going to cry out for during my life. And I might not be able to get into the promised land, but I can take them to the bank of the river. I might not be able to see the land flowing with milk and honey fully manifest in my time, but I will get closer than any generation before me so that the generation after me doesn't have to go through the same battles that I'm going through. They get to stand on my shoulders and go into the land flowing with milk and honey. But look, it only happens if we realize our position in history, our position in the flow of blessing that the Lord has for us. If, this is why we get discouraged sometimes. Sometimes we receive promises from the Lord and we think, great, that's going to happen in the next two weeks. Perfect. God's calling me to manage wealth. He's calling me to be a resource for the nations. Look, sometimes the Lord in his divine omnipotence just snaps his fingers and bam, all of a sudden there's money everywhere. We have testimonies of people that walk into wealth that they never knew existed. Inheritances that they never knew existence. And they go from poverty to extreme wealth overnight. But listen, sometimes the Lord gives you a word and says, I'm going to make you a resource for the nations. And the, your family is going to be one that is the, the lender and not the borrower. And sometimes we get discouraged if we don't realize, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be the first person that to ever graduate college in my family. And I'm going to start something so that the generations that come after me become the lender and not the borrower. Does the Lord want to bless you? Absolutely. Is he giving you promises he's going to fill in your lifetime? Absolutely. But listen, if you only have promises that are going to be seen in your lifetime, I think we're dreaming too small. God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God that starts something in one generation and completes it in another. The dreams of their fathers being passed down to their children. Look, Abraham carried a dream that he was going to be a father of many nations, that his descendants would outnumber the stars. God took him out at night and said, look up at the stars. How many stars are in the sky? He said, God, only you know. How am I supposed to know how many stars there are? He goes, listen, I will make your descendants even more than these. Abraham died with one son. He didn't see the descendants outnumber the stars. But the generations to come did. The generations that came after him did. Are you guys alive? Look, this is an encouraging thing. I know I'm saying that some promises are for a future generation, but you get to be encouraged by that. I'm not taking away your promises. This isn't me saying, well, I thought I was getting a new car this year. Look, you God can still do that. What I'm saying is we have to live for a generation that we might not ever see. Because the decisions that Moses made impacted the decisions that three, four, five, ten generations down the road made. If Moses says, no, I'm not going to go back to Pharaoh. I'm not going to go back to, to the, the land that I was raised in. I'm not doing it. This isn't happening. If the people of Israel said, look, we're not, I don't care about the promised land. It's too scary. We're staying here in the wilderness. We'll set up camp here. Then the generation that follows, they don't experience the fruit that they experience. Listen, sometimes, sometimes you're in a season with certain areas of your life where you receive a promise and you're the generation that gets free from Pharaoh. You're the generation that gets free from the oppression. You say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give my life to ending these dysfunctional cycles that have run through my family. These cycles of depression that have gone from generation to generation, that will end with me. And what they experience after me will be peace and love and joy in the Holy Spirit. Look, sometimes you're the generation that cuts the head off the snake and says, that's not going to continue. That does not get to flow into, this, into my bloodline. That won't be what our family is known for. And sometimes you're the generation where the generation before you did that, and now, now you, get, get to, you get the freedom to go and find the promise. In that area, in that sphere of influence, you go, you know what? My, my family before me, they fought to get free from that thing. I, it's not even a temptation for me anymore. 
I don't have to fight the same battles that they had to fight. But if we don't understand that they fought a battle to set that family free, then you don't do what you're supposed to with the freedom. But I feel like the Lord is calling us to be a people that live for a generation that we'll never see. Right here on this property, what are we going to do that inspires the next two or three generations of people that sit here in these chairs and worship the Lord and reach out to this community? What is it that we're going to do that generations that come after us look back at our lives, they look at our memorial stones and they say, I am free. I am freer today than I ever would have been because they, they fought that thing. They beat that thing. They got that porn addiction out of their life. They got that greediness out of their life. They got that jealousy out of our family. They dealt with the anger issues so that I don't have to. Listen, my goal, my goal in life, I have all kinds of things I want to accomplish. But more than anything else, I want, I want my kids to stand on, the sh on my shoulders as I'm dying and launch themselves far beyond what I ever thought possible. Why? I want them to see clearer than I've ever seen. The Lord is giving you grace to leave a legacy for the next generation. To leave a legacy for the next generation. You know, I've been really blessed. I've been extremely blessed to have a family that leaves legacy. And that has left me legacy. You know, I am, I'm fourth or fifth generation pastor on my, on my dad's side. And generation after generation has given their life to preach the gospel. Given their life to start churches. My grandfather, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't raised in a house like that, but he gave, he gave his heart to the Lord. And he did so so fully that when, my, the, the, when all the kids had left the family farm, they sold the farm and they moved to South America. They moved to Mexico, Honduras, and the Philippines. And they planted hundreds of churches, schools of ministry, raised up pastors, raised people from the dead, saw all kinds of crazy miracles. They would come up once a, once a year to hang out and come and you know, let, give an update to churches that were, that were supporting them. And every year they would come back with stories of people that should have been dead but are now alive because they prayed for them of people bringing their animals to him and saying, you know, I, I heard the stories that people were being raised from the dead. If you would raise that person from the dead, you think you'd raise my donkey from the dead? You think you'd raise my chicken from the dead? I, I, I need this chicken. And he would, they would pray, and, he's, and it would come back to life. Look, he, he fought to establish in the Veach family a legacy it says we are a family that pays a price for the expansion of the gospel. And I grew up with these stories. I grew up hearing about people being raised from the dead. I grew up in kids' church. My dad was the kids' pastor. And I remember kids ripping casts off their legs because God had healed them. And in their childlike faith, they just decided, you know what, if I'm... If I'm healed, I don't need the cast anymore. So they find the cast in the parking lot, and you find the kid running around in the back of the church playing kickball. Listen, there's a legacy that's been passed down to me. What I get to experience in my life, it's not what I fought for. It's what other people fought for. My grandfather fought for that. My dad fought for that. My mom fought for that. There are things that I get to experience in my relationship with my wife that I didn't fight for, that my parents fought for. That's my wife. Just for context, not just some random girl screaming. That is my wife. <laughs> but I get to stand further. I get to start further ahead than any generation before me because they paid a price. Because they went through things so that I don't have to go through them. And I'm going to do the same for my kids. Look. Aaliyah started praying in tongues when she was like two years old. Two years old. We're in, our, we're in our dining room. And she starts to ask us about the Holy Spirit. She heard us 
praying in tongues. He said, what is that? And we begin to explain it to you, or the Holy Spirit is going to come inside of you. He's going to baptize you, and you're going to experience power when he comes upon you. And we, we asked her, we said, do you, want, do you want to experience the Holy Spirit? She said, yeah. So we began to pray for her, and she began to speak in tongues. And ever since then, any time that there's something going on, she just, she quarantines herself with the Lord. I'm not even kidding. She'll wake up and go, you know, guys, I have a really bad attitude today. And I need to fix it. I'm going to go be with Jesus, and I'll be out in a couple minutes. I'm not even kidding. She'd go lay in her bed, go pray in tongues until the affection of her heart had shifted back to heaven. Then she'd come back and say, okay, I'm good now. Like, come on. Like what happens, what happens as the next generation, all they know is the miraculous. All they know is the spirit of God. All they know is that our God is a God of miracles. All they know is that they should believe for the impossibilities to bow. All they know is that there is a God that will always provide for them, that will always be faithful for them. That when they see the kids sick on the playground, they don't just go, oh, they're kind of weird. I should stay away from them. They run to them. They say, I know a God who can heal you. I know a God who has an answer for the pain that you're experiencing. Let me pray. Let me pray for you. Let me pray for you. Look, these, this stack of journals that I, I brought up here. This is, these, these are some of my memorial stones. Sorry, I get a little emotional when I preach this message. These are some of my memorial stones. My grandfather passed away. Uh, my dad and my grandma passed some of these down to my sister and I. To my, one of my grandpa's old Bibles and some of his preaching notes. And this, this one here, it's a book of sermons my great, my great, great uncle wrote all in the Holy Spirit. Every one, there's probably 60 sermons in there, all in the Holy Spirit. Like I said, on a regular basis, I pull these off the shelf, and I sit and I read them, and I just cry. Realizing that this, this is the account of the Lord splitting the Red Sea from my family generation that I, I, didn't, I didn't necessarily get to see it happen in them, but I, I have the account that it happened. This is them following the pillar of fire at night. This is them walking through the wilderness. Look, I read through these and it's, it's awesome. You know, my, some of them are my grandfather's preaching notes and he, he would have this sermon written out and then he would take notes on the different sermons, you know, so some of them he would have the whole sermon written out, and then there'd be a giant X through it. The top would say, this one stunk. Never preach this message again. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I feel better about myself. <laughs> but then other ones, the notes say, 10 people got up out of wheelchairs at the end of this message. 100 people gave their life to the Lord, and five deaf ears were opened. And I look at that, and I go, there is a legacy that has been passed down to my, from my grandfather to my father to me and will be to my children. And part of who I am, I'm one who gets to steward that legacy. I'm a link in a chain that's going to go far beyond my life. And whether I step into the promised promise land in every area or not, I will at least get them to the bank of the river. I will at least get them to the bank of the river. So all they have to do is walk through. All they have to do is cross that, that Jordan River. Look, sometimes, you know, growing up, I, I, I thought my testimony was a little lame, honestly. You know, everybody that the church would, would bring in and, and put up front, they were all people that, uh, I was addicted to drugs for, you know, 90% of my life, and the Lord gripped me, and he changed me, and he set me free, and now I'm this burning ball of fire for the Lord. And everybody I talk to gets saved and, you know, da 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 Or, you know, I was, I had this, this really rough upbringing, and, but the Lord grabbed me. The Lord saved me out of this. And I remember sitting there going, I don't, I don't have a testimony. What is my testimony? What am I going to get up there and say, 
I've been saved my whole life. Right? At the time, I'm like, oh, it's a little lame. I need something to spice it up. I need to go work on this thing. But listen, the Lord, any time, any time that I ever tried to veer off course, the Holy Spirit was there to bring me right back on. But listen, that's not because I was some genius kid. It's because I had parents and grandparents and great-grandparents that, that had prayed for my salvation. The generations had cried out for my life. And I'll cry out for the life of the generations to come after me. My kids don't stand a chance. So I've come, to, I've come to realize, listen, my first, my first memory, my very first memory is of giving my heart to the Lord. I was two years old. My dad had preached the salvation message in kids' church. There was 100 kids. He preached the salvation message, and kids responded and got saved. And I remember walking into my parents' bedroom and asking what that was. And I remember my mom setting down the stuff that she had whatever she was doing, sitting down on her bed and getting down and telling me what it meant to ask Jesus to come into my heart. And they asked me if I wanted to do it. Because my very first memory is with the Lord. So that's a testimony. I've never known a day, I've never known a day without the Holy Spirit. I've never known a day without the saving grace of Jesus Christ in my life. I have never known a day outside of the blood of Christ. I have no idea what it's like. I don't know what it's like. And I pray the same is true for my children. And I pray the same is true for their children. And listen, if, you, if you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, I, that was not me. Well, guess what gets to happen for the next generation? Guess what gets to happen for the next generation? If, this is, if you're the first generation to know the Lord in your family... Guess what you get to do? You get to leave Egypt. You get to cross the Red Sea. You get to go towards the promised land. You get to create a legacy that they get to experience, that they get to rejoice in their whole life. My wife, she was, she's a first generation Christian in her house. Her, her third, grade, third grade teacher, first grade teacher, first grade teacher, her name's Miss Duncan. Nobody in, her, in my wife's family was saved. Her first grade teacher grabbed her and said, oh, you should come to church with me. And she took her to church every Sunday until she was 18 years old. Every Sunday until she was 18 years old. She's the first generation of believer in her family. And now we've watched as the blessing of the Lord even goes back and her mom is getting touched by the power of the Lord. And her dad is being touched by the Holy Spirit. And her family is being influenced by the Holy Spirit. But listen, the move of the Lord that happened in her, now every generation that comes after her has the opportunity to know him from birth. To come out into an environment of worship and praise. Where we say we're following the pillar of fire. That's who we are. That's what we do. Can you imagine being born in the wilderness? You don't know anything different. You have, no, you have no memory of Egypt. All you know is that we follow the pillar of fire. We follow the cloud in the day. We follow, we follow the, the fire at night. This is who we are. This is what we do. We are a people that are dependent upon the Lord. Well, that's amazing. That is amazing. All right. Let's do this. I want to pray. I want to pray for anybody. This, you're a first-generation believer. Where you're the first one in your family to give your heart to the Lord. If that's you, I want you to stand up. I want to pray for you. Is that anybody in here? Yeah? Because listen, all you guys, all slow to stand up. Part of being, being in the body of Christ part of being a member of the body of Christ is that you get to receive from the corporate inheritance of the body of Christ. You get to step into the flow of his legacy. And I want us to take him in. I just want to, I want to pray for you. I want to pray that there would be a new momentum behind you. 
And I want to pray that your life would be one that touches the generation that comes after. That the generations that come from you, that they would experience the presence of the Lord in an even greater measure than you have. That they get to stand on your shoulders. That you get to live for generations that you've never seen. Okay, let's take a minute, let's pray. Now, Lord, I, I ask, I ask for an inheritance to be added to them. I ask for an inheritance to be added to them. God, I ask that that in this life, that they would see giants fall, that the next generation won't have to fight. That they would see freedom that the generations before them haven't seen, the generations after them will have an abundance. God, I pray that you would give them a grace to start momentum in their family line. Say, we are a family that follows the presence of the Lord. We are a family that joins together with other believers in the community and goes after God. We are a family that, do, that does relationships well. We're a family that does finances well. We're a family that, that spends time with God. We are a family that worships the Lord. We're the family that follows the pillar of fire at night and the cloud by day. That in this family, the Lord sustains us. That's who we are. It's what we do. It's what we do. Yeah. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. I'm just going to do a general. I'm going to pray for everybody now. I, look, I, I feel like it's a big deal in God's heart. I feel like if we, we start to get this, we start to live for 100 years out. We can't, we can't live just for tomorrow. We can't live just to make it through another year. We can't live just to meet a five-year goal or a 10-year goal. We gotta be living in a way that goes, man, our kids are gonna burn. They're gonna burn with the presence of the Lord and their kids are gonna burn. Their kids are gonna burn. So I, I wanna, the last thing I wanna pray for here is, is anybody who has... There are people in the next generation that have wandered, like the prodigal son, who said, you know what, I, I need to build my testimony a little bit. I want us to, I want us to pray for them. I want us to pray that, that your prayers would rein them in, that your prayers would surround them and that would pull them back. Is that anybody in here? You have children or grandchildren that you've been crying out for. All right, come on. Let's pray. Lord, right now we pray for that next generation, God, for any that have, have turned off, decided to try and do something else. God, I pray in your mercy they would be surrounded by the presence of the Lord, that they would be surrounded by the goodness of God, that like the prodigal son, they would have a moment of revelation where their, their eyes lift to heaven and they say, how much better was my life? When I, was with, when I was with my father, how much better was my life when I was with the Lord? And God, I pray for reconciliation. I pray for reconciliation. That your hand would be upon them. That your hand would be upon them. And God, that even now, that in the next couple days, God, they'd be picking up that phone and calling home and saying, I, I need to get right with the Lord. I need to get right with my family. Yeah. Yeah. All right, Jeremy.